what's really interesting is we do have, you know, a lot of our real estate investor clients, people who are doing real estate pretty full time, um, have very low income, right? L low W-2 income, if any, right? Or it's all just rental income. Hey, Renter Retires, it's Adam Schrader here with another episode. I am joined as usual by Zach Lemaster, the founder and CEO of Rent to Retirement. And we have brought one of our tax specialists in. This is Amanda Hahn. She is the director at Keystone CPA. Amanda, thanks for rejoining us. Yeah, I am excited to be here. Uh, tax time is the best time. So uh, <laughs> glad to be here talking about taxes while it's on people's minds. Well, I'm glad one of us uh, thinks that it's a, a great time. So just remind everybody a little bit about yourself, um, kind of not only how you got into the CPA, but also how you got into the real estate side of uh, taxes as well. Sure, sure. Um, well, my uh, my name's Amanda, and I am a CPA by day and real estate investor by night. So like a lot of you guys, I, uh, I also still have my job in accounting. And um, our firm is Keystone CPA. And what we do is we specialize in working with real estate investors nationwide on, on how to use real estate to really um, save on taxes or at a minimum create tax efficient income streams. And um, so yeah, not only, um, you know, do I advise people on how to use real estate to save on taxes. Um, I always love coming on these shows to, you know, just kind of look at the latest and greatest in terms of investing strategies too. Yeah. Can you define tax efficiency? Just a little bit further, because we, we, we are aware that uh, investing in real estate, and we're going to talk about some different scenarios today. But I mean, we're aware that there's many tax benefits to invest in real estate. But but can you talk a little bit about specifically what you mean about tax efficient avenues? Sure. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, in the real estate world, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit, I'm sure um, there are many ways to reduce taxes. Um, sometimes taxes on the rental income itself. Sometimes you can use rental losses to offset other income like W-2 or even, you know, retirement distributions and things like that. And um, so we see real estate as, 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 as a tax efficient investment because not only does it allow us to have write-offs like business owners do, um, but we also get to take depreciation against the rental income that we generate. So comparatively to other product, other investment products like stocks, bonds, or mutual funds, um, you know, that, that don't offer depreciation write-offs, uh, that makes real estate a more tax efficient type of investment vehicle. Yeah. I always like to tell people, even if you're not a real estate professional, how do you feel about making money and not paying taxes um, mm -hmm. on that part? <laughs> even if it's not, you know, even if it's not saving you money on your W-2, do you like making, you know, four or five, six grand a, a year on a property and then not paying taxes on that? Because, I do. I mean, I made a lot of money in Georgia last year and they want $20 from me. So, you know. Well, if you, and I, and I love compounding that too over time, right? If, if you had $100,000 from your, your rental income portfolio um, and, and now that's what, you know, you're, you're living on, um, you know, just because of the, the different write-offs and deductions and depreciation and all that adding up. I mean, in, in most cases, you probably have little to no taxes to pay on that $100,000, which would be the equivalent of what, like 160, 170, maybe in a few years, this tax bracket go, goes up even even higher. So I think it's just a way to mitigate, uh, you know, and, and preserve your income over time. Yeah, so, and Amanda, I think too, oh, go ahead. I was gonna ask, as a real estate investor who's being tax efficient, and obviously it's that time of year where everybody's giving you everything, what kind of things as an investor should I be downloading, uploading, all of that, things like what are some of the things that real estate investors need to have ready to go um, as they're giving their CPA all of their stuff? Yeah, I mean, you know, real estate investing in itself, if we're talking about rental real estate, um, it's really a business, right, in the eyes of the IRS. And so, um, you know, in addition to maybe the profit and loss on the property that your management company is giving you, or you've been tracking yourself, um, really take the time to make sure that you are capturing your non-property specific expenses. So things like education, going to conferences, travel, business meals, all those types of things. Um, if you use your car for real estate, right, you, you want to make sure you're tracking those and sending it to your tax person. Um, and when we talk about, you know, using your car, it's not just limited to driving to the property. 
a minority audience has, you know, a lot of people who invest out of state, right? So you might not be driving to your out of state rental a lot. But if you're driving to a local real estate meetup, you're driving to the bank, or you're driving to meet with your attorney or your CPA about real estate stuff, make sure that you've tracked those and that um, you're providing that information to your your tax advisor. Um, similarly, for home office too, if you, you know, use the home office to, um, you know, help manage and, and maintain your rental properties, make sure you're tracking those. I think one thing that I see missed a lot from people um, is uh, purchase, sale, and refinance items. So uh, oftentimes, if your CPA is not well-versed in real estate, they might not be asking you for those documents, but it's really important that you provide those because there are a lot of costs that are uh, tracked in those closing disclosures, right? So um, I always, you know, sometimes I see tax returns that say, oh, you know, the depreciation uh, based on the purchase price is, you know, $200,000 exactly. And I immediately know that's not right because sure, the purchase price might be 200,000, but there's a lot of other costs associated, closing costs, points, and you know, um, fees that are allocated to you. So making sure you send that to your tax person so they can pull all those additional expenses on from there too. And and tax person probably not advising like H&R Block, right? Probably to have a, a tax professional that is familiar with real estate, such as yourself, Amanda. But um, let us let me just ask this, because there's there's so much that is considered a, a deduction. You mentioned a lot of those right now. I mean, I even potentially so far as like, you know, even filing taxes would be a business expense, right? Or anything related to the loan, operating the property, the, uh, you know, property management expense, your insurance uh, for the property, mortgage interest, things like this. But what is, so all that adds up and it makes a significant difference. Uh, and those that rolls forward on losses, right? So if you if you offset all your income on that property for this year, that rolls over into the following years as well, correct? Yeah. But what my, my question to you is, what what is not a tax deduction on an investment property? It's probably easier to define just what, what we can't deduct or expense. Yeah, I mean, so, so, so for an item to be tax deductible, it has to be ordinary and necessary to your real estate business. And so, you know, what's ordinary for Zach's business might be different for my business, might be different for Adam's business. So when you're spending money, just ask yourself that question, right? Is this money I'm spending, is it necessary and is it ordinary for a real estate investor to have these types of expenses? So in other words, if something that's purely personal in nature, um, then those are typically not tax deductible. But what about uh, <laughs> maybe on like a short term rental, for example, if you're adding furniture and things like this that are going to be associated with while well, you have some personal use of it, but it, it is does have business income, do things like that count or things to improve the property from a user perspective on a short term rental? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's perfectly fine to have some personal benefit you know, for um, these expenses, the key is whether there is a business purpose to it. So um, we talked about car as an example, right? So you don't have to use your car 100% for business in order to write off some of it. Um, you know, so it's common, the most common scenario is your car is primarily personal use, but you're using it sometimes for real estate. And so what you do is you can allocate a percentage of those car expenses as it relates to business miles um, and be able to deduct some of that business use. So yeah, certainly doesn't have to be 100% business use to be a tax deduction. So basically, and the rule is if it's if it's necessary and usual based on your business, then it's pretty safe to be an expense. We all know Adam runs some very unusual and unordinary businesses. I don't know what he does at his houses, but he will have, certainly have different deductions than I will. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I think um, this time of the year, uh, is when you know everyone's thinking about taxes for last year um, for some investors maybe um, who didn't do as good of a job tracking their expenses last year or maybe this is the first time they're hearing that they can deduct these other you know expenses outside of just the property itself um, it's really important to make sure that you don't just send the property management report to your tax person, right? Definitely send that to them, but that's not the end of the story because odds are your property management company is not tracking all these other things. They don't know about your car. They don't know about your home office. They don't know that you went to a real estate conference. Um, so really important to not just send the management statement off and be like, you know, I'm done with taxes, right? Take the time to make sure you're providing all that other stuff to your tax person. Yeah, and make sure you go over it because uh, sometimes things slip through the cracks with your management. Uh statements not saying that it's ever happened before but it could have happened 
you know, here or there. So it's always good to compare your numbers to theirs and make sure because I definitely have called uh, management teams and been like, um, why, why wasn't this included? And they're like, oh, okay, well, we'll add that on. So you know, double checking is a, a good thing to go. So let's get into it a little bit. You know, we talk about ordinary, we talk about, you know, business uses, we talked about kind of general tax write-offs. Let's dive down into actual, you know, strategies and kind of returns that you can get. And one of the reasons we wanted to have you on is to talk about there's many different ways to invest in real estate. The most common would probably be straight purchases of properties. Um, another one would be people investing in REITs. And another one would be a syndication investment. So <clears throat> wanted to kind of dive into somebody has spent $100,000 in real estate in 2022. In one case, they bought two properties that were worth $200,000 each, put down their down payments, and now they invested that $100,000, and they make about $8,000 a year off of that, uh, that income, off of that investment. Another one is somebody just bought in $100,000 worth of REITs. Um, we all know that 2022 wasn't great for REITs, but let's just say they earned a, a 5% you know, return on that. Uh, they didn't cash out anything. They just kept it in there. And then the other one is they've invested $100,000 into a real estate syndication. I believe we agreed that they weren't going to accelerate any depreciation year one or do anything like that. Kind of how does it differ um, in these three scenarios when it comes to your actual taxes? Um, well, I think the the treatment of those you know three different types of investments will differ based on the facts and profiles of that investor itself, right? So if you and I invested in, in these three things, um, the, the losses might be treated very differently, assuming there are tax losses. Um, so if we are assuming this is like a first time real estate investor, yep. maybe they're combined or, you know, single person, or their income is like $100,000 or less. Um, typically, if you're investing in a property that you own, right? Direct ownership, like maybe something they bought from rent to retirement. Um, typically, you're able to use up to $25,000 of tax losses to offset W-2 and other income. Um, and when I say loss, I, I mean like strategically created tax loss because you mentioned we have like $8,000 of cash flow, right? So we're making money, we're not losing money. We're making money, but through... Um, home office, car depreciation, if we were able to create tax losses for that particular year, we can use up to 25000 of that to offset taxes from our W-2 income. Um, and this is for direct owned real, uh, real estate, whether personally held or um, in an entity like an LLC or partnership or something like that. Right? Um, compare that to your third scenario, which is like a syndication. Syndication meaning I'm taking $100,000, I'm investing in someone else's deal, I'm maybe one of 100 investors. Um, in that scenario, even if we do accelerate depreciation, even if we assume all the numbers are the same, um, one of the major tax differences is that loss, that K-1 loss from the syndication, you generally are not able to use it to offset taxes from your W-2 income. Um, and that's just, you know, kind of a pitfall in the way that syndications are structured is that, you know, if you're not a real estate professional, right, you're just working a full-time job, have this one-off passive investment on the side, um, you can't really use that $25,000 allowance to offset your W-2 income. Um, there certainly are other ways to use passive losses like from a syndication, but, you know, if we're going down this scenario of one investor, you know, not super high income, one syndication, um, that's a, a, a pretty significant difference in terms of your own real estate, being able to offset some of that W-2 income and passive real estate not able to offset that income. Is it fair to assume then based on this scenario that in any one of these scenarios, um, you're investing in a REIT, 100K REIT, 100K in syndication, 100K um, using a little bit of leverage to buy two properties that, but in any scenario, in most cases, like actually physically owning a property allows you to have the, the highest tax deductions. Is, is that a fair assumption? 
yeah, right. In this scenario, because um, it, it, the limitation itself is because in the syndication structure, you are you, you must be passive, right? Uh, I'm assuming you're not one of the general partner, right? You're just one of the passive investors. And so um, because of that, because you legally can't really do much of anything at all with respect to the real estate, um, that's why the losses are highly limited. Now, if you were a real estate professional, let's say, um, then the, you know, the facts are different and then you might get very similar benefits, whether you're doing your own property or a property in a syndication or something else. But REITs are just like a whole different ballgame, right? <laughs> um, REITs are, are basically stocks. So it's, just, it's the same as investing in Apple stock or other types of stock. Um, so typically, you know, if the REIT invests in the rental property and there's depreciation, there's these kind of benefits, they don't flow through to you because it's just a corporation, right? And so what generally happens is um, the tax implication comes in when you start to receive dividends from that REIT. So if the REIT gave me a dividend of $1,000 this year, um, then I'll pay taxes on that dividend income that I received. Again, just the same as if I invested in Apple stock, Apple gave me a dividend of $1,000. Why we encourage people on our end to physically own property is not just because that's our business, mainly. We have other passive ways for people to invest with us, and we have people that do that. But I think it's important to physically own the real estate because that could potentially, yes, it's a little bit more active, right? Like you, you're subject to tenant changes and things like this, managing your manager um, and, and things like this. It's, it's not completely passive, whereas a reader syndication where you're just giving money to someone else. Um, and there's, there's risks associated with those as well, right? Um, it, it's really up to the operator uh, on making sure that investment is successful. But the reason we like people to physically own real estate is because I think it helps to advance their, their returns, their taxability, and, and also maybe position them to be in a position where they can qualify as a real estate professional to then take advantage of some of these other different tax benefits, right? And, and when we talk about leverage, like what I would do with this $100,000, um, I don't know if you if you think differently, Amanda, based on your investing strategy, but I would take it and leverage the crap out of it and buy five houses, right, uh, with with that. And so and each one of those houses has a tax uh, benefit, depreciation schedule, additional source of income. Um, and, and I think that's really a, a good goal to scale that way. Obviously, choose the right path based on, on your goals and experience um, and what you want to do. But I, I want to hone in on just one thing that you talked about, but is crucial. And I do not think a lot of people realize it was this $25,000 um, kind of deduction. So essentially what you're saying is that even if I'm not a real estate professional, if I buy one property, I know there's income limits with this, so we'll talk about this. But if I just buy one short one property and it's a passive a turnkey investment in Kansas City or whatever, and I make, I think it's what's what's the income limit? Is it one twenty five or a hundred thousand? Is when it gets phased out. So yeah, so if you make a hundred thousand dollars of income or less, then you can use up to twenty five thousand dollars of losses against W two income. Um, if you make a hundred fifty thousand dollars or more. Uh, then you're completely phased out. So between 100 and 150, you get part of that 25,000. Is that married or single, or is it? Uh, it's both. Yeah, it's both. Yeah. Okay. So, so it doesn't so matter. Like marriage. <laughs> so this is this is huge, though, right? If if you are in this tax bracket of 150 thousand dollars annually or less, and is this is this gross income? I would assume, right? Ag adjusted gross income. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So if you're 150 thousand dollars or less, this means you can have upwards of a $25,000 tax deduction just for buying a property. And Adam, I don't think we've mentioned this a lot to people, right? I don't think everyone's... No, I, don't, I don't think we... may Maybe one time, but it's uh, rare if we have. You don't have to be a real estate professional. This could be your very first property. You know, you can have just by simply buying that property. And this has nothing to do with accelerated depreciation, right? It's just, you're, you're just taking that... You can take up to that $25,000 loss for that year, now, is that $25,000? Do, do you have to, I, I'm just trying to think through this and I haven't personally done this. We, we do accelerate our, our depreciation on properties. Um, and that is our, our sole investing strategy today. But what does this $25,000 have to be a, a, a loss from, you know, all these deductions and all these expenses adding up? Does it have to equal $25,000? Because my next question is, is that achievable with say just one property? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it definitely could be achievable. It just really depends on the profile of the property. Um, so the 25000 is just a max, right? So let's say I have a rental property. Um, I have my income. I minus all of my rental expenses. 
I take regular or accelerated depreciation, right? Either one. Um, and I created a, a, a $10,000 loss. So I use a 10,000 loss. If I created a $30,000 tax loss this year, then I can use 25,000 of that immediately to offset my income. The remaining 5,000 is just regular passive losses that carries forward into future years. So this could be from anything, right? This could be all of, it's just basically the total loss from expenses, your closing costs, your insurance, your depreciation, all of these things that you have have used is that that's your loss cap is 25k, whether mm -hmm. it's one property combination. I mean, I think personally, this would be fairly easy to accomplish with a couple properties, most certainly with three. If you're if you're just if you're buying them and just looking at all the costs associated with buying a property, I think one to two basically would allow anyone to take an immediate tax deduction of $25,000, right? And, and how we deduct our income is just like anything else is it's going to lower your tax bracket the higher tax bracket first right so if you make 150 that drops your your basis down to 125 or something like that right amanda yeah yeah and um so the phase so the phase out basically if your income is a hundred thousand or less you can use up to the whole 25 um, and then it's kind of like a 50% phase out. So meaning when, you know, when my income goes to 125,000, um, I can't use 25 losses. I can use half of that, right? So 12, you know, half of 25,000 basically. So every dollar that you exceed the 100,000 income limitation, um, your benefit is cut down by about 50 cents on the dollar. And so what we've seen clients do is, um, you know, let's say you're hovering or you're a little bit over the 100,000. So if you maximize your retirement contributions, if you have a job, you know, uh, contributing to like a 401k, for example, lowers your taxable income and then can potentially get you down closer or, you know, lower than that 100,000 threshold. Yeah, this is huge. And again, this isn't even talking about accelerated depreciation, which you can potentially look into as it really to, I mean, this is this year we're at 80% a bonus depreciation next year it's going down to 60 and 40 and being phased out eventually but th this is huge right i mean this is this is something that people should should be conscious of, of if they're in this income uh bracket if if you're making more than that then you definitely need to buy more real estate and start to <laughs> looking at some other ways to, to offset taxes well, let, let's look at it a little bit amanda just tell us the difference i mean if someone has a if someone makes a hundred thousand dollars let's just say there's you know no real estate involved at all your tax bracket at $100,000 versus $70,000. How big a difference tax-wise is that? Mm, I don't know. Good question. I'll have to pull up the tax chart to see <laughs> what the brackets are. Um, but I think something that Zach mentioned is really important for people to know about um, the tax savings that it comes off the top. Because I, I often have clients ask me that, you know, like, okay, my, my tax rate is 30%, but my, my true rate is only maybe 20%. So why are we considering the write-off at 30%? Well, the reason is because when we talk about reducing taxes from income, it's always coming off of the very top. So you're looking at, okay, well, you know, if my income is at 100000 what bracket is that in, first and foremost, um, to see what the true tax savings is. And I also, um, I think, you know, earlier you were mentioning, like, the concept of um, being more comfortable with leverage, right? And we actually did a, a calculation recently. We said, okay, if I had $100,000, I use it all cash to buy a property. I don't want any debt at all. So my depreciation, if I do accelerate depreciation, maybe I get, you know, 25 up to 30,000 of depreciation. But if I was really comfortable with leverage and I use that 100,000 like Zach did and buy $500,000 worth of real estate, now I'm looking at 125,000 or more in depreciation. So it's really phenomenal when you think about how we can leverage the bank's money and the tax code to effectively get us so much tax benefit um, using that same hundred thousand dollar example. I mean, you work with a lot of successful and, and wealthy real estate investors. Um, would it be safe to assume that most everyone is basically following the same same path to some degree? It's. I mean, it's it's doesn't it's not overly complicated. It's <laughs> it's use leverage appropriately <laughs> and strategically invest, right? And just continually continually do that. Um, you know, yeah. I think that's, that's, that's the path, but, uh, I mean, most certainly a lot of the, uh, successful investors that we, we interview, um, regardless of asset class, I mean, everyone's, it, that is that same process, right? Using leverage and expanding your portfolio and, and the scaling over time. Um, and we're not even talking about the benefits of using leverage in a high inflationary environment <laughs> where you're paying the bank back with future dollars that are worth less. 
there's that aspect. But leverage is just a, such a powerful tool. I'll, I'll get off this 25K here, uh, but I have one more question. What what is this part of the 2017 tax act or where did this come from? Is this going away? Um, you know, do people need to be act on this now or what's the origin of this 25 K uh, deduction? Um, it's actually, you know, for as long as I've been practicing in, in, in taxes, um, that's always been the case. So it's not new. It didn't just come out recently. Um, I think the reason you don't hear people talk about it a lot is because I think most people associate real estate investors with people that have high income. Right. Um, and so because the threshold is fairly low, people don't really uh, talk about it too much. Because we're always talking about real estate professional status and short term rental loophole um, to try to offset some of the you know people in the higher income bracket. But what's really interesting is we do have you know a lot of our real estate investor clients, people who are doing real estate pretty full time. Um, have very low income, right? L low W-2 income, if any, right? Or it's all just rental income, um, much lower. So yeah, I think, you know, it's, that's one of the reasons you probably don't hear this mentioned as much um, because of kind of like what you typically think of a, as a profile. But um, I thought it was really interesting. You were saying, you know, for successful investors, are they still using the same concept of leverage and, and taxes to build wealth? And um, I think the media always um, tries to, position wealthy people is kind of like the bad people, right? The, the tax law is so skewed and they use these very advanced strategies to, you know, avoid taxes. But like you said, there's not, there, this is not, you know, rocket science or brain surgery, pretty simple in how these are used. The, the same strategies we work with on someone who makes a hundred thousand dollars is very similar to someone that we work with on $10 million of income right? The concepts are the same, whether it's leveraging your rental properties, leveraging the equity in your home, leveraging your stock market, you know, to get loans to buy more real estate. Those are all great ways to grow well. Yeah, it always we've talked about it before, but you know, love them or hate them when Trump's tax thing came out, and they're like, he only paid $980 in tax. I was like, why was he paying tax? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and his, his response was, that's because I'm smart. Yeah, it's you know? smart. But I was like, why, why did he even have any taxable income at all? I would think with all the leverage and everything that I, we've heard about that he would be, you know, at at least zero, if not uh, refund yeah. status. But he didn't he didn't buy enough property, Adam. Yep. He didn't <laughs> buy enough property that year. Um, but Amanda, most most I would say you know, people that are starting out investing, a lot of the people in our demographics, they're they're right in line with this this income, you know, it, in this hundred fifty thousand dollar range, give or take. Um, that means there could be some benefit. Uh, and if, mm -hmm. and if you're not, I mean, if you don't have a CPA that's aware of this and filing it appropriately, you, you may have missed it. And these things you, you can't do wrong. I mean, it's important that you're doing them appropriately and working with the right professionals, just like with depreciation, the IRS, you know, will account for as if treat you as if you took depreciation, even if you did not. So you don't even get the benefit of it and you still have to, you know, pay the tax on. So it's, it's just important to know about this. Um, but this, I think this thing is huge. You know, we haven't really hit home on, on this 25 K opportunity but this is a way to just if you're in the income bracket just by buying real estate have an immediate tax deduction that's more than you can contribute to your your ira um in in most cases right so this this is a larger that can affect anyone i would fall into this income bracket paying uh from r2r as a s corp or an llc s corp selection i'm a w2 employee so um you know this is this is important stuff to talk about yeah yeah so you mentioned, you know, being using leverage correctly um, and strategically and getting comfortable with it. With all of your dealings with real estate um, investors, what have you seen help people get more comfortable with leverage? Because, you know, most of the time people who come to us, they're they're OK getting loans. But there's still some people who are like, you know what, I just don't want a mortgage. You know, I, I don't want to have that hanging over my head in some senses. And I don't really understand it, but I'm sure you've seen it more than I have. Kind of how do, how do you help people get over that fear um, whenever you're talking to them about their taxes or anything else like that, or yourself as you've gone through your real estate investing? Yeah, well, I think you know, for me, I just uh, when people are um, kind of concerned with leverage, a lot of that is emotional, right? Emotional connection to 
um, maybe like upbringing or just the stability of having something that's fully paid off. But um, well, because I'm a CPA, so I'm a numbers person. So for me, it just really comes down to the numbers. Like today, you know, in today's um, marketplace, a lot of people are very concerned about interest rates and the fluctuation of it and essentially pulling the plug on the goal of investing in real estate altogether. Um, but I think it's really important for us to look at the numbers of every deal that you know, a client is looking at to see, because if the numbers make sense, does it really matter that interest rates are very high? Because I can always refinance, right, and get to better rates. For me personally, I've invested, um, you know, like the first property that my husband and I invested in was in, in 2008, uh, which was when like real estate was almost like a bad word, right? Nobody <laughs> talked about real estate. Everybody um, was doing know. investing in 2008, right? <laughs> there was blood in the street. Everybody was buying. <laughs> Yeah. And, um, and, and, you know, I mean, you know, we've had properties where interest rate was like 8%, 9%, but, you know, I mean, over time we refinance and, um, you know, I think sometimes the biggest regrets is like, I should have bought more right at that point in time. So it just comes down to the numbers. I love that point, Amanda, but can you just hit on one thing too? Uh, there's a lot of confusion and I often, um, get questions about when you go through a refinance or a new loan, what are what are the tax implications? What is does that change anything on the depreciation schedule? How does that differ from a tax perspective on a property that you already own, or how is it different from buying a property for the first time versus going through a new loan on it or refinance? Yeah, um, so there's no tax difference when it comes to depreciation. So when you refinance, you know typically the property value is higher, but that in itself doesn't result in any additional taxes. Your depreciation just remains exactly the same, right? Those are completely unrelated. Because um, it's based on the purchase of it, purchase. the initial purchase of it, not a high, higher appraised value down the road. Exactly. Okay. Um, and even if you're doing, so if you're refinancing just for a better you know, rate and terms, that's fine. Um, the closing costs, the refi costs are just going to be amortized over the life of the loan. Um, if you had an old loan that you got rid of, you can actually write off the cost of that, um, the, the financing for that old loan, because now it's gone, right? We've replaced, so you write off the cost of the old refinance loan, and then you amortize the cost on this new refi. Um, even if you do like a cash out, right? So let's say I have a bunch of equity in my primary, I want to do a cash out of Fifty or hundred thousand dollars, use it for real estate investments. Um, the cash out you don't have to pay taxes on currently because it's just a loan. And if that loan proceed is used for investment properties, the interest becomes tax deductible against the rental income that's generated from your rental portfolio. So um, really, no tax downside to you know accessing the equity or doing a refinance for better terms. And that's that's huge. I think a lot of people don't realize uh, how crucial it is and, and what opportunity they have when you're going through a refinance, doing a cash out or even a HELOC. That's that's not a taxable event uh, for you. So that's huge to be able to access that capital, reinvest it, start earning income on it and interest and then also have additional tax benefits. Right. This is where real estate starts to, to compound uh, every property you buy. Absolutely. Well, Amanda, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. I'm sure we'll have you back on for more tax discussions because, uh, well, I think it's, is, that, is it your favorite topic or maybe, maybe it's that and cost segs, I think, are the your two favorite I topics. despise taxes and that's why <laughs> I work so hard not to pay them. Legally. <laughs> Legally. That's the important part. Uh, so Amanda, you can find out more information about them at renttoretirement.com slash keystone. That's renttoretirement.com slash Keystone. They have some goodies that they're offering to Rent to Retirement listeners. Uh, again, really appreciate you spending the time with us today to help us get there. I know you're going to be underwater for the next uh, next few weeks until the until it's over. So maybe we'll wait until after tax season's over to, to have you back on. But for everybody else, if you want to get those tax benefits, head on over to renttoretirement.com and check out our inventory. You can see everything there. You can schedule a call to talk with us about the strategy you can use and you know, just getting those first properties and helping you through it. That's renttoretirement.com. Also, don't forget to leave us a review on whatever podcast platform you use and send us a screenshot of it. And we will get you a $10 gift card and an entry into a raffle for a $500 closing cost credit. And final one here, if you're interested in the top 20 uh, markets to invest in in 2023, you can get that report from Zach by emailing podcasts at renttoretirement.com. We will get that sent out to you right away. So thank you so much for spending the time to educate yourself today. 
and we'll talk to you on the next episode. Thanks for watching the Rent to Retirement YouTube channel. Check out some of our other videos, like this one, or this one here.